because I'm 90 years old, I have Parkinson's disease, and the, you would think that the end is nigh. However, I've been working ever since I retired 30 years ago, and over most of that time I've had Parkinson's. In that time I've managed to travel all around the area, um, several times to the USA, I'm a member of the Royal Aeronautical Society. I'm also a member of the Vertical Lift Society of the American Helicopter Society, calls themselves. And I'm a member of the Guild of Aviation Artists. If you're having trouble hearing me, make it known and I'll try and speak up. Anyway, um, I joined the Royal Air Force in 1949 as an RAF engineering apprentice and then became a navigator and when I came back from Canada fully trained I in fact found that uh, the RAF had gone from two to one navigators in the Canberra and um, I didn't really want to be an RAF engineer I joined the Air Force to fly and I managed to find my way out on a super priority um, ticket and I came on to ferry aviation and I spent three glorious years flying up and down the bay in meteor fighters firing guided miss missiles. Then I moved on to the Rotodyne project. So there's no clockwork mouse of a helicopter for me for my first rotary winged flight. The Rotodyne was tip jet drive, 40 seats and 200 miles an hour. When the Rotodyne finally got cancelled, mainly on noise, I found myself um, in the flight test department at White Walsham, the ferry airfield, by which time I was working for Westland. And I stayed in flight test at Westland for the rest, rest of my life, moving down to Yeovil in 1964. And I retired as chief flight test engineer from, from Westland. Then came the big surprise, the Kelly Johnson Trophy, and I think I can say I was the first, it was the first time the trophy had been presented outside America. It happened, I think, four times since. Now, let's talk, first of all, about the, the S SFTE, because, of course, the American SFTE is a great number of chapters and they all know each other and the USA seems to be very much more generous than most of our lords and masters in getting their people to symposium. We on the other hand are the first truly international chapter because whatever we might say about being Europeans we're still finding our way around the various nationalities. And I'm pleased to say, in spite of the so-called Brexit, I, I'm another foreigner in the system now. And of course, there are the Swedish and the, Nor I think the, Dan no, the Norwegians. So um, we're all still a lot of various nationalities speaking together and we're the first truly international chapter. Okay, that's enough about me and it brings me to the various points I want to raise. And the American organization was certainly one of them. Um, we seem to have found a way around the engineering awards by the, and here the language comes in, 
the, the award we have here now. And congratulations to the winner this year. And long may this go on. But I was going to suggest <coughs> that um, it might be a good idea for us to think in terms of an equivalent to the director's award as well. And if we do that, um, I'd like you to think back to my generation because we have Franz Anzinger, Wim Dixon, and um, Barbara Wood very involved in that. Now, I was there in those heady days, but I was engrossed in the Lynx program. But um, the whole European chapter is really a the, the, due to the work of Wim Dixon. So you might like to call the director of the Wim Dixon Award. And remember that we are a great debt to Franz Einsinger, and we also are a great debt to Barbara Wood. And I can report, because I rang Barbara Wood's number today, that she is making progress. So that's some good news for everybody. Now let's have a look at my copious notes I've made. Um, the other thing is I think we should cover our debt to the past. Henry Ford said, history is bunk. He's quite right. It is just nostalgia and let it lead to the future. And so I think we should treat history as a tool rather than a little bit of interesting side stuff. Um, I've been involved in the archive at Westland for the last 30 years since I retired and the last 23 years since I've had parking. And it's only recently that my mobility has made life difficult. Now, as I say, when the flight test engineers were first formed, we were nearly all aviators. And the flight test department ran the flight program. And people ignored us at their peril. However, we now have a whole mass of um, program managers to deal with. And everybody has them. Engineering has them. Design has them. The test organization, the ground test organization have one. The sales have one. And all these program managers run out of time and budget before they pass it on to us. Sorry, did someone want to say something? No, go ahead, Paul. Uh, sorry, go ahead, okay. um, David. Okay. Please continue. Um, what I would say is God must have loved program managers. He made so many of them. But as I say, when it gets to us, all the money's been spent, all the time's been used, and we're expected to hurry. And I have always had to tell them you can't hurry flight tests because there are no laybys in the sky. You can't just stop and wait for the AA to turn up. You've got to get it back down again. So safety is no accident. And I think people should be well aware of that. Um, on the other hand, program managers are conscientious blokes just like the rest of us. And we've got to find a way of working with them. And they've got to find a way of working with us. The little presentation I've got up was one that I did a long time ago to try and recruit flight test engineers. And you see that the growth of avionics has come into it. So a whole new aircrew function has emerged. In past times, FTEs manage the whole flight program, but engineering issues are now often in conflict. 
And I think it's, it's our job to find a way of working. When I first took over a flight test at Westland, I got all the guys together and I said, look, I want no one man bands in this department because you know what one man bands are like. If they stop playing, you don't get any music. So make jolly sure you've got a, a shadow. I often used to do this to them. And on the day I retired, I got a big card that said, oh no, the music stopped. Anyway, um, so at least they were listening. Um, but as I say, this, the other thing that you've got to be very aware of is that 50% of our membership, or more, are no instrumentation engineers. Telemetry, television cameras in the cockpit, everybody's involved in flight tests in some ways. And although they've always known they know all about it, they do know a bit about it now. And this brings on to the other point that I'd like to make, that we must think about our way of the world. A friend of mine was involved in a crash with a telemetry controller. And a telemetry controller was really aid with air traffic, who really want to take the aircraft if there's an emergency coming up. And he has to make sure the data is flying in properly and make sure the telemetry room is cleared so that we can get on with the job. But the other difficult thing is that he's a practicing flight test engineer himself at the minute, and that should always be, I believe, because they know all the flight disciplines, they know the pilots, and they are very much in touch with what's going on. But um, they have the unenviable job of talking to their friends while the aircraft is in peril. And they might find they're talking to their friends as they die. And that's a pretty heavy responsibility. And this particular friend of mine suffered post-traumatic shock, and I'm not surprised. He received no help from his company, and he was on his own. And I think that's an area we've got to study as part of our flight test procedure. I think Al Lawless has got it in mind, as well, I'm glad to say. And um, it seems to me that everyone in the telemetry room should be at least interviewed to see how they've taken the situation because there are casualties on the ground these days in a way that they never used to be. So there's a little bit of food for thought for everybody. Um, that was the one in particular I wanted to um, go along. But I'll go on to show you this little bit of fun I had with my people. Can I change the slide or? With pleasure, David. Here comes the next slide. There we go. Okay. Qualifications, engineering degrees, always been sitting in the background. Qualified air crew with engineering experience. Or a qualified FTE from one of the registered schools. Air crew requirements, physically fit to fly, clearance to fly from the ministry whatever it might be, survival training. And here was a bit of fun. At one time, they wanted us to fly over the water for the first time. We heard all the safety exits working properly. <clears throat> and they thought I would be very obstructed by refusing. Um, so I threatened a meeting at Yo nearby Yeovilton. Unfortunately, I got wind of what I was trying to do because I booked the whole design department and engineering into the Dunker. And all of a sudden, it became easy. So the specialized training, including the Dunker, survival, radio, and everything else, is quite an aircrew requirement. Other requirements, 
ability to produce a clear and accurate report. I could never get my guy to handwrite one. I don't think anybody can handwrite now. Basic computer literacy. Prepare to work unreasonable hours and travel over great distances. And the final one, a smart personal appearance. Jobs, bikers and lights need not apply. Okay, switch the next one over. Very satisfying and glamorous job. Almost macho, but you can't say that anymore. There are lots of excellent lady engineers as well. Okay, next one. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Next one. Next one. There's a lot more going on under the surface than you might think. Now, I don't know if you can read any of those. I can't. Um, but they cover the whole thing of writing reports, dealing with the hangar, dealing with sales. Now, there's a thing that was the bane of my existence, air show. They take it, they tell me not to use the aircraft too severely for about a week before the air show, in case I break it. They take it to the air show and they would break it. They get it back. We wouldn't get the aircraft for three weeks. But in the program, it said Farnborough Air Show, four days. The, um, there's a big one, pilot. I talked to a NASA friend of mine about that one day. He said, you think you're having trouble with pilots? He said, you try working with astronauts. You know the way pilots think they're gods. Astronauts know they're gods. Anyway, um, there's all those things to contend with in this great iceberg. And so farewell to the Titanic. And if you go to the next slide, Even Airwolf needs a little fat man in the back with his computer. So I think there's still a role for us. And finally, you know nothing about boredom. You know a lot about awkward people and how to deal with them. You'll be constantly asked to do jobs which you think are outside your ca capability but never admit it. And um, as I say, you'll never know, you'll never know a heart, great wealth, but it's still a jolly good job. And I have yet to retire at 90. Okay, we must be getting near trying to get the meeting back on schedule. <laughs> Um, David, um, you, you are perfect on your timing, and, and I could listen to you all day. So don't worry. You you you've got a lot of uh, stories and uh, and knowledge to pass on to us. I don't know, Paul, whether you wanted to say a few words uh, in response to to David's message. Um, well, what what remarkable is is that the message Mr. Gibbons provides is is actually not from. It's actually still applicable today. Um, and, 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 and my experience and the experience of Mr. Gibbons, they are a world apart. Um, so a great thank you for your stories, your shared experience and your humor. I think it was the best way to start our campfire sessions. So thank you so much for participating um, and being part of our symposium this year. Thank you very much. Can I just finish with something? Uh, I talked to EGPS one day the Empire Test Pilot School, and I started by saying, flying airplanes is easy. If it was difficult, the engineers would have to do it. <laughs> there was silence. And then the flight test engineers started to applaud. So I'll leave you on that note. 
Once again, thank you very, very much, David, for taking the time to uh, to talk to us. Uh, I know you have a lot of preoccupation at home, so uh, it's uh, it's a, a great thing that you were able to speak to us. Uh, and I see that you have been uh, watching the the presentations yesterday and today. Uh, so I hope uh, that you're interested in in the stories which our presenters have got to tell. Uh, and it just goes to show that even 30 years after you're retiring, you can still learn something new every day. Yes, indeed. Thank you, everybody.